since back on the well, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to call the City of Colwood Special Council meeting to order. It's 6.33. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Lekongwin speaking people. And we're honored to have the, uh, this opportunity to build strong working relationships with the people of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. May I have a mover and seconder that tonight's agenda be adopted as presented? Councillor um, Olson and Councillor Grove a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you very much. Uh, public participation, I don't think we have no one registered to speak virtually and I don't see anyone from the public out in the gallery. So we'll move on. Um, we'll carry on with, uh, with unfinished business from February 20, the February 21st, 2023 special council meeting. And uh, we have online here our, this evening, uh, the Greater Victoria Public Library. I would just like to welcome, uh, we have some great guests this, uh, this evening. We have Andrew Appleton, who is the uh, chair of the, uh, the GVPL board, uh, Maureen Sawa, the CEO, and Paul. The your treasurer, right? Treasurer or VP finance? Yeah, direct. Thank you. See, I, I've already left for six months and I forget who you are already. Anyways, at this point in time, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Greater Victoria Public Library. Good. Very good. Good evening, Mayor Kobayashi, members of council and staff. Uh, thank you for inviting us to present our, present our 2023 operating budget. My name is Andrew Appleton, and I have the uh, distinct honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board. I'm um, also your municipal colleague. I serve as a uh, district councillor in the district of Oak Bay. Uh, with me to, to present this afternoon is our CAO, Maureen Sala, and our director of finance and facilities, Paul McKinnon. Uh, I'd like to recognize Councillor Ian Ward, who is your councillor representative on the GVPL board. Um, the commitment that the councillors make to uh, serve on the board is, is not unsubstantial, it's significant, and we appreciate that. Um, and also wish to reckon, uh, recognize uh, His Worship Mayor Doug Kobayashi, who served on the board for some years. Uh, I served with him on our planning and policy committee and lots of enjoyable and productive time working together. So uh, really, uh, really pleased to be presenting in front of you tonight. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, how important it is, just, just the significance of public libraries and providing a space that everybody belongs and provides an ability to change lives. Um, we're committed to working with our municipal partners so that together we can build communities by providing citizens with equitable access to information, services, and resources to grow and learn. You've received our budget package. The library board and staff have worked hard to present a budget for 2023 that's realistic and resourceful. On behalf of the library board, the staff and community we serve, I would like to express my thanks to council for your continued support of the GVPL. We're proud of the work that we do and feel that the work is extremely impactful and, and really can contribute to the life of every single citizen across our service area. So I'll turn things over to Maureen for the remainder of the presentation. Maureen, Paul, and I look forward to responding to any questions they may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's so great to be here for real in person. It's been a while since we've actually been physically with you. So that's a real delight. Paul and I are thrilled and so happy that Andrew's here with us and to see Ian and Doug and, and Robert and everyone. It's great. So um, what I wanted to do at the beginning is just, again, to remind um, particularly new councillors that um, Greater Victoria Public Library is a shared service model. Um, your library system is funded by 10 member municipalities. So this is a great thing because it enables us to provide all of our municipal members with a standard of service that would not be possible if only if you were the only municipality funding it. So can you hear me okay? Is it 
Okay, that's great. Okay, and what we like to say is GVPL is the definition of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And you can see the geographic range that we, we cover and we will talk about the funding model when we get down to the numbers. Um, so just a few pictures. I always think a picture uh, is worth a thousand words just to give you an idea of some of the things that we've been up to over the past year in terms of enhanced cultural displays and spaces. Um, this is one of my favorite photographs of a little little boy who was very jumping for joy when the library reopened. Um, one of our most successful and popular community programs is actually our children's program, our annual BC Summer Reading Club. This past year, over 8,400 children from across the system participated. And I thought you would like to know that um, the Wanda Fuca branch um, was the second highest in terms of completion rate of the Summer Reading Club. And if any of you know about Summer Reading Clubs, you know that there's a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning, but, but going through the whole summer and finishing it is, is quite an accomplishment. So I was just pleased to see that, uh, that Wanda Fuca certainly was the the most um, diligent, second highest. Um, the other thing we wanted to share with you tonight, we haven't tabulated all of our 2022 um, uh, statistics, but some things that I do get asked quite a bit about is our use of digital resources. So here is just the list of the top five of 2022, um, and also our most studied languages and our LinkedIn learning courses, which um, as some of you know, we been promoting that quite a bit in terms of self-directed adult learning. Um, this was particularly important during the pandemic and it continues to be so. Um, one um, a, a tidbit of information is that the um, continuing surge and usage of our collection of digital resources continues and it was over 1.8 million times accessed in 2022. And just a few photographs of some of the activities that GBPL participated in over the past year. Um, and then I want to focus on some photographs of the Wanda Fuca branch. Um, the Wanda Fuca branch, as you know, is co-owned by Colwood, Highlands, Langford, and Chosen. And we're very proud of the fact that we have updated it quite a bit. And I was just there on my way here this evening, and we have a, a, quite a lot of updated contemporary furniture, uh, new study desks and laptops and a refreshed layout. The branch is so popular that I learned um, last year that it was spotlighted on something called the National Entertainment website, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that is a website that features locations that um, where Netflix original productions had been filmed. So apparently Wanda Fuqua was was featured in a movie called Rescued by Ruby. Um, I don't know if any of you saw it, but apparently we were featured. But that, that's a real testament to uh, what a gorgeous branch that is. It's very, very well used. Um, we're very pleased to reinstate Sunday openings in January, and they've been very, very popular. And I was informed by staff this afternoon that um, there were uh, there's a lot of homeschoolers that also take advantage of the space during the day. So just to remind you, we are halfway through our two-year strategic bridging plan, of which Mayor Kobayashi knows quite a lot about. Um, this was a, a plan that um, the board determined um, was required to um, reestablish some of our infrastructure and strengthen our culture of equity, diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility to kind of make the leap from before COVID to after COVID. So there were four priorities just to remind you, digital literacy and access, focus community building, and making a difference, showing our impact. I wanna pause on this one for a minute because that is a picture of our, our coordinator of um, customer service. And the library has been doing some very innovative uh, service developments. So Sarah, who's in the photograph and her colleagues were featured at the Ontario Library Association's annual conference last month. That's the National um, Professional Library Conference in Canada. So even though it still calls itself Ontario, Library Conference, it's the de facto national conference. So GDPL was invited to present sessions on our uh, patron-centered customer service model and also our partnership with the Victoria Native Friendship Centre. So we were very, very proud of the work that we did here. And then again, making space for everyone to feel safe, respected and valued. 
And again, just a kind of a, a little bit of reference to the programs that we provide for newcomers. Um, conversation circles are taking place in many of our branches and we're very happy that, that our space is continuing to evolve. So in terms of this year's 2023 budget, um, again, and Paul will speak to this a little bit um, in a couple of minutes, but just a reminder that approximately 90% of the GVPL operating budget is funded by our 10 municipal partners. Um, and in 2023, uh, just as many other organizations are dealing with increased costs, um, we have focused a lot on operational efficiencies, but certainly the costs that we are dealing with have gone up. So in terms of the budget request for 2023, we are requesting an overall municipal contribution increase of 5.95% increase. Um, Again, we can speak to the specifics of that, of that in a couple of minutes, but um, again, I think um, you will appreciate that this budget has gone through a lot of scrutiny. Um, we have 19 um, members of our board, 10 are municipal councillors from our 10 partner municipalities. and. Paul and I can speak to um, the level of scrutiny that this budget has gone through um, even before it goes to the full board. So uh, it, it has been uh, reworked and revised as much as possible. So what it means for the city of Colwood in terms of 2023 is that um, this does mean a 10.10% increase over last year. And we can we can explain how the formula is, as you may remember, some of you, it is based on con converted assessment values and population, including rental adjustments. So in conclusion, I would just like to uh, thank you for your support. Um, this is an image that we, we feel is really reflective of the Greater Victoria Public Library. Um, we are trusted and valued community assets. We serve the needs of so many people and definitely are catalysts for change. Um, and we like to think that we help people change the world. So thank you very much. And we'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, I'll open it up for questions from Council. Council Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, Andrew, and, and Paul for taking the time to visit. Not so much a question, I just wanted to um, you know, express my support. Obviously, I'm a big proponent of, of the libraries and, uh, and probably will have to share with my colleagues at some point the Palaces for the People uh, book, which uh, has had quite an impact. Um, you know, the value of that social infrastructure and, and what it adds to a community is, uh, is critical. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time. Councillor Jensen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is great. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, are there some communities that are not part of this? And uh, by my count, uh, 10 communities are. Are there some that aren't, aren't uh, contributors to this? Um, so there are 10 municipal members of the Greater Victoria Public Library. Um, that's 10 from the Capital Regional District. Three uh, municipalities of the CRD actually belong to our neighbor, the Vancouver Island Regional Library System for reasons I really don't know. <laughs> it's historic, um, but that's, that's how it, it breaks down. So there's 10 municipal municipalities of the CRD, and then the remaining three belong to the Northern Library System. And yeah. Is that further out of town then, I take it, or out towards Sioux? Well, um, Sydney, or... Souk, and um, North, Saanich. North Saanich are the gotcha. three that don't don't belong okay. to the Greater Victoria. Everyone gotcha. else does. Yeah. Thanks. I was trying to do the math. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Councillor Dave. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. I wanted to ask you about your community space that you provide mm -hmm. at the library. Um, I know that you provide it. I'd like to know how well used it is. It's it's um, now that we're kind of out of the the worst of the of the COVID kind of space planning. Um, we do um, work with ICA um, and Verks in terms of community space for conversation circles. Um, a lot of programming, as I said, um, my understanding is that there's a regular a lot of homeschoolers kind of take advantage of the space. We worked hard with Juan de Fuca branch 
because it is so big, you know, and there's so many areas. So when I came in this afternoon, it was evident that people were there in groups, people were there for independent study um, and such things. And, and programming, we're gradually kind of rebuilding our programming schedule. So it certainly is one of the spaces I know that um, the um, school district um, group is really interested in what public spaces are available in the West Shore. And, and we do have a very good meeting room um, and it's certainly very accessible. Yeah, it was, um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that anac an acronym of ICA. It, uh, it's the Immigration um, um, Service Downtown. So they, they have conversation groups um, for uh, people learning English. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. No, I meant like yeah. the, your physical spaces that mm -hmm. you, community groups could rent mm -hmm. your space to put on programming mm -hmm. of their own. I don't know, AGMs or whatever mm -hmm. for different interest mm -hmm. groups that mm -hmm. may be mm -hmm. uh, putting those things on because that's kind of a, a valuable space in our community. Yes. And I just wondered how well it's yeah. utilized. I think um, it will become busier as, as people start coming out more together in groups. I mean, what we're finding is that there still is, it's still not quite where it was before COVID. So I think that's uh, definitely, though it is one of our most popular spaces. But I think we can say it hasn't it hasn't completely come back up to pre COVID usage. Yeah, great. So, are you seeing like fifty percent of the time that it's booked, or I would have to check with staff. I'm sorry, but that's I can okay. get that information for you. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Councillor Grove. Thank you. Um, um, thank you for the presentation. The, uh, we're in budget stuff here, so I just want to ask you a couple of questions from my own curiosity, where a contribution and call it has increased uh, uh, certain amounts, so it's higher than the overall increase. I'm just curious when you said it, I think you said growth and assessment changes. Is that, could you just explain that a little bit to me? About how that Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a common question. It, it pertains back to the library operating agreement and the governance overseeing the funding model specifically. So a bit of background on that model, just in terms of then I'll get into a bit of the growth side of things. 50% uh, of the, the requisition formula comes from tax assessment. 50% comes from population. Uh, those two put together uh, for each individual municipality or funder within the overall 10. And then the percentage of that equates to your piece of the pie, if you will. Uh, Colwood did see, as with we're seeing in generally in West Shore, one of the higher tax assessment uh, growth rates. This is from fiscal 22, and for the purposes of this, which comes from BC, uh, BC data and BC stats, BC assessment was just under 25%. Uh, so it was one of the higher ones, and that's the change year over year from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22. So I always like to give the example that even if our budget was a 0% increase, so the overall requisition on a set of 5.95 was zero, you could still see an adjustment based on how your requisition and population growth floated within the region overall against the rest of the areas. So, yeah, I thought maybe that had something to do with it. So our brand is in, it's a premium brand, right? Premium brand. Oh, that, is, that is one way to put so it. So you got to pay the price, right? Yeah, the, um, it's always a, a reminder that you're paying into the system as a whole, not for your specific. Of brand course, interest. I understand that. Yeah. The uh, other question, just about the transfer of reserves, was mm -hmm. a lot, uh, increase this year. Is that to help to control that? increase this year a little bit? Was that why you did that? Absolutely. There, there's a, a few different answers to that question. And I'll start with a reserve process overall, because it is slightly different than what you see in municipalities in that our reserves are allocated out of typically year end surplus. They're allocated by approval of the board and the finance committee purposely for specific projects or facilities uh, replacement. And so the reserves that we hold are planned. And so the, the input into those reserves is planned and, and, and the, the transfer out is planned. So two things going on here. Yes, I am smoothing the revenue by use of reserves. So surplus that we accumulated from the COVID years, so specifically 21 into 20 and 21, um, we had quite uh, the surplus coming from, um, coming from vacancies and staffing that was allocated at year end. And so in order to smooth some of the requisition amounts, I'm using contingency to do that over the course of the five-year plan, which I think you'll see noted in the budget ends in fiscal 24 as the last year we use contingency. And then we're also using reserves to fund uh, library materials and also a replacement reserve for funding of specific projects within the system for renew of shelving and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 
and no other questions. I just want to, again, thank you very much for, for coming out and uh, doing your presentation. And just thank you for your outstanding service to, to our public. It's been great. Great to see you. And Councillor Grove, uh, rest assured, I was, I was part of that uh, uh, budgeting process. And didn't, 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 like the, didn't like the results. And that's when I first found out, geez, we jumped up to the fourth largest by population here in, in Greater Victoria. That was a bit of a shocker for me. So, yeah, I was trying to uh, change the algorithm, but they didn't let me do it. <laughs> he, he did. He, he did. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very out. much. Great to be here, and thank you for your Thanks. support. Thank you. Ms. Hepting, you're on. Thank you very much. So tonight we will continue on with our budget deliberation conversation. As you'll recall earlier this week, I mentioned moving out of the capital plan review, which we completed on Tuesday evening, we will now return to each service area. And so this is an opportunity for council to affirm the top three priorities that have been identified for each area. It's an opportunity for council to ask any questions of our teams regarding our special initiative projects. In addition, Council last month resolved the service level that is to be delivered in each of these areas. The related uh, property tax increase implications, the financial implications of that specific service level has been incorporated into this draft financial plan. Ultimately, as we move through each of the service areas, uh, we will be seeking whether or not Council wishes to recommend any changes to this draft financial plan. When we, can, when we conclude the conversation and we've reviewed, um, again, all of the city's service areas, that will uh, really conclude the review of this draft financial plan in its entirety. And then the next steps will see us back in chambers to introduce the financial plan bylaw. And so we'll we will start tonight, as you heard from me on Tuesday night, one service area, council directed an increased level of service. So we'll start tonight's review with that service area, and that's that of policing, and then we'll return and we'll just move through the document, um, starting with uh, administration and corporate services. Similar to Tuesday evening, please just indicate if you have any questions at any time, um, and, and we'll proceed. And so starting with policing, uh, Council did direct an increased level of service specific to the addition um, of one RCMP officer in 2023. The top three policing priorities are before you. If you wish to make any changes to these, uh, now is, is an opportunity. I'll pause for Councillor Day. Councillor Day. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to talk, and I thought this was the best time, um, about the mobile use services team. Uh, as I think everyone is aware, um, we are uh, coming up against the end of the funding for the counselor position who's been working with the mobile use services team. And I found out uh, just today, actually, uh, more information about where her funding uh, both comes from and uh, where it's come from for the past three years. So for the past three years, um, funding has been received from the federal government uh, for uh, the counselor uh, position that is provided through Pacific Center Family Services Association. That funding ends uh, in, at the end of this fiscal year. And um, uh, when I was speaking with the Mobile Youth Services team uh, today at the Victoria Family Court and Youth Justice Committee meeting, um, it, it, the police uh, officer who is uh, currently from Vic PD is also very concerned about the end of her contract um, uh, payment from the federal government 
and uh, is speaking to um, the great need in all of our communities uh, to fund that. This is funded through the integrated policing services. So every police services within the capital region uh, contributes to those. Um, and uh, I, I just uh, wanted to check in with council because it was an issue of concern uh, as to whether or not um, we could direct any further uh, investment of energy towards uh, improving that situation. I, th I think it's appropriate that it's funded through the integrated units because they go where the need is and kids are very mobile. Their parents might live in one jurisdiction and, and their other parent live in a different jurisdiction uh, as well as they may be moving from time to time. So, so do you have a sp specific question, Councilor? Yeah, I'm just wondering, is that something that we would advocate for with staff or is that strictly, um, you know, I'm not sure where to go with that in terms of, do we direct that through our RCMP um, contract or how do we impact that other than writing, you know, another letter uh, supporting that position? Because the mobile use services team has been providing services in Colwood regularly, as in they've been here every two weeks at Dunsmere Middle School for quite some time. Uh, working in a plain clothes environment with a counselor available to support them. And uh, we are at risk of not being able to maintain those relationships, uh, both through funding being an issue and through potentially circulating other officers. So, um, uh, in fact, I, I did take this up with the MLA because my letter went off thanks to you. And uh, we're, we're getting provincial support on this right now. And that's when I found out it was federal too. And they, they can only support us at this point in time and, and they've lobbied for us. But uh, I, I think what you might maybe suggesting that it's all the CRD, that it maybe it's a CRD issue. Okay. Uh, and maybe that's what we have to do is that has to go to the CRD. And okay. maybe we have to coordinate it that way. That that's my approach on. I this. just I didn't want to do this in isolation where everybody's not on the same page. Right. Just trying to. Uh, this seemed like the right time to talk about a funding issue for something that is supported by both police and a local resource agency. Okay. In fact, um, I'm meeting with the mayors again right now with the, with the West Shore, and I'm going to get support from more of them right now. I know two, three of them already support me on this because I asked them if they were gonna submit the letters themselves and they did. So this is maybe something we can bring up as a group from the CR to the CRD. Perfect. Uh, that's another approach. Okay, thank now, you. Now to get all the police forces working together is a, a different situation. That's the interesting. Yes, absolutely. Is, is that an answer your question then? If, if I did, so, okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jensen. I thank your worship, uh, and uh, I, I wasn't going to speak to this, but it's a, it's an interesting discussion. All I can say is uh, there is a joint management team that oversees that unit, and they're not before us here asking for anything. I mean, it's well administrated. There's lots of people involved, and I don't think uh, beyond advocacy that that we uh, you know should be entertaining something in in our municipal budget with regard to this. This is a it is a joint unit that has a whole governance structure behind it. So beyond advocacy, your worship, I wouldn't recommend it come to this table in any other fashion other than that. Yeah. I'm happy to advocate till the cows come home. Uh, beyond that, your worship, I did want to uh, kick off the dialogue since this is before us here. Um, I expressed some concerns at the last meeting about us anticipating future construction of infrastructure without really some certainty whether this is going to uh, uh, come to fruition or not. And I have some concerns about that. And I'm specifically, I'll speak to the, the police building and our, our uh, intention to begin to tax in favor of uh, that future construction. Uh, I have some concerns in that regard. Uh, we're going to 
ask the taxpayers to kick in, you know, roughly two odd percent uh, this year uh, for a building that may not come to fruition. I know that you had your uh, thoughts uh, that you expressed at the last meeting to your worship based on your discussions with our neighbors. And I, and I believe that's, that's uh, um, I think that uh, we're a long ways away from any certainty on that. So how can we ask our taxpayer to crack open their wallet and, uh, you know, provide us a, a, I think it's, I can't see that far, Jen, but is it 2.9%? Is that what I see there? It's through your worship. So up on the screen is a little bit of a background here. Um, and perhaps I'll take a moment. As you'll recall, when we talk about the breakdown of our property tax increase, the additional 1.0 RCMP officer represents 1.1% increase. We had an extensive conversation earlier this week about what we anticipate to be the annual debt servicing requirements. So should the upgrade proceed as has been presented in the options analysis, when that construction's complete, when we recognize our proportionate share, about 24%, um, we were anticipating debt servicing costs of a little over 1.1 million. We know there's a number of factors um, that are subject to change, but for, for planning purposes, we're looking at debt servicing of a little over 1.1 million. We also know that there will be increased both operating and capital mm -hmm. expenditures on an annual basis once we get up and running with this proposed facility. And so for planning purposes, we were looking at Come 2026 or 2027, this city will require an additional $1.3 million. <clears throat> that generated some of the conversation during service review um, and earlier this week about how do we start to prepare the community for that tax increase. Yes, there is some growth that can support it, uh, but ultimately we will need to look to our existing ratepayers. The 1.79% increase to support an increased transfer to the police building reserve. There are a number of ways in which we could phase in how we fund this. What's been presented in this draft financial plan is okay, we're anticipating approximately $1.3 million. If we equally phased that in over each of the next four years, an additional $325,000 in each of the next four years. That's how that 1.79% increase came to be. You are absolutely correct. We could consider countless alternatives right. um, with respect to how we could phase in and, and prepare the community for, for that that's a great level of taxation. Or... So I'll pause with that, I, I, um, but that's some of the background before. Sorry, I love that uh, backgrounder, and that's a great uh, um, view of, of what we're trying to achieve. And I, in no way am I speaking to the efficacy of whether I believe we need a police building or not. I'm strictly talking dollars and cents, your worship, and I am going to propose a motion right now that uh, we not include the 1.79 percent increase in this budget year i believe that there's uh, too many unanswered questions and that we're years away from we might be years away from a decision let alone the construction and to ask the community to start paying a 1.8 percent this year i think it might be just a little bit too soon by next tax year we should have some more certainty with regard to the work that we're doing or that we anticipate doing as far as planning and then maybe we can do this with a little more certainty in uh, subsequent budget years. That's my motion uh, for uh, uh, an opening bid for discussion, Your Worship. Um, yeah, it's it's a question of do we want to front end load this or do we want to end load this? I'm that, looking. That, that's what it comes down. I'm to. looking for a discussion. I'm not even saying I support this one way or another, but my motion is that we reduce our ask by 1.79 percent, uh, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, can I get a seconder on that motion so we can open it for discussion? I'll, I'll second it. Okay, uh, Councilor Ward will second it. So now I'll open it for discussion and I'll come back, circle back to you, Councilor Ward. Sorry, I didn't, uh, wasn't watching your. Okay. 
Councilor Ward. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It feeds right into my, my question. Anyway, I think when this proposal initially came before council, I supported it in principle in, in that, you know, the, the information is there to, to proceed on it. My question, maybe Mr. Earl or Mr. Mayor, one or the other, or both could answer is that when it first came forward, the inference was that a decision needed to be made in a fairly timely manner. Um, and that our, our partner municipalities were going to act in a similar fashion. And View Royal subsequently did make a decision, but Langford has yet to even put it on an agenda as of this evening. Um, I've spoken with Langford councillors. Um, I, I can't, I shouldn't divulge the private nature of the conversations, but it doesn't seem to be as high a priority as I was led to believe. Um, and it leads me to believe that, you know, maybe we are moving a little bit too fast. And in terms of the, you know, the hit to the Colwood taxpayer, it concerns me that um, that we're leading the way on something when when in reality, Langford is the, the largest stakeholder in this. And, you know, I, I don't know if we should be the ones leading the, you know, it's the cart leading the horse. I, I think I'd be a little more comfortable if I had some assurance from our sister municipality that they were actually going to do something um, and that it aligned with some of the proposals that we've seen, because frankly, I've heard a lot of different information from folks on the other side of the border. So maybe there's some clarity on, on where Langford stands. Um, I can't answer that. I, I can tell you that I've had the discussions with the mayor. Um, from what I understand, it's not even going to hit their agenda till the first week of March, which is, I guess, the week after next week. And so, um, yeah, there's there's clearly not the uh, um, the rush that we seem to have. We we all thought we agreed to something back in early January when we had the discussions, and and I, I talked to um, Mayor Tobias over in, in View World, and that was his impression too. That's why we both tried to achieve it before January 31st, because that's what we thought we agreed on. But the biggest stakeholder uh, didn't interpret it that way. And, uh, you know, if the biggest stakeholder says no to this, then, you know, we're, we're doing something else, obviously. So uh, I hope that answers your question. As best I, I know right now, this is all I know. And uh, we are, in fact, uh, just so that you know, we are going to be discussing it uh, tomorrow because the, th the three of us are together uh, for a meeting at one tomorrow. And right after that meeting, we're going to go into discussing this, in fact. Because, uh, you know, I've got to get a better feeling for what's happening there. Uh, it was pretty, um, it was nothing concrete, that's for sure. When I talked to Wet Wednesday at the CRD, that's all I can tell you at this point in time. Uh, Robert, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, at the end of the day, I got very similar messaging. Langford has not yet made a determination on whether or not they have chosen to proceed. The urgency uh, that was uh, presented to uh, the municipalities uh, was primarily RCMP. Um, um, the narrative was prim primarily from the RCMP. The information that we provided uh, is that we are uh, at or nearing capacity. I, I think uh, a decision um, needs to be advanced um, in 23. Um, it will likely be a, a multi-year process, uh, but at this juncture, uh, talking to my colleagues, uh, and as described, uh, Langford is the, by far the largest uh, contributor to this project. And so until uh, Langford makes a determination on how they'd like to proceed, uh, we're fundamentally waiting. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Dave. Thank you. So, I really, uh, I'm conflicted uh, because I, I do really believe in uh, saving uh, so that uh, we can afford large expenditures. We generally do that through reserve funds, build them up so that you can see by the plan that's in front of us, we, we are looking to uh, gather between one uh, 0.3 and up to 1.79% uh, from our taxation for the next four years uh, in order to build up that pot. 
Uh, I believe in that because when we do it over a number of years, um, it isn't one set of taxpayers uh, uh, who, who contribute, it's um, spread out over time. So we don't ask for all the money from, from one, one group. And then uh, after they've moved out of the community, another group moves in and they have the benefit of this wonderful asset that uh, the previous owners paid for. Uh, so doing that intergenerational spread of the cost of big ticket items is something I, I truly believe in. Uh, but I have uh, considerable concerns that we don't have a very clear process when it comes to the management of the West Shore RCMP building. We don't have a formal police commission, committee, whatever you want to call it, uh, which other municipalities do have uh, where they have joined uh, blended service providers. So uh, if I was to say um, what I needed to be comfortable with this level of taxation, that's what it would be. I would like to know uh, that, that our residents' voices uh, are, are heard um, fully uh, at that table and that all considerations are on the table. Uh, there's been considerable doubt about that, but at the same time, uh, I'm a little concerned that we there is a very large requisition looming um, that we may not be collecting money for. Uh, so I guess I'm a little bit on the fence. Uh, certainly uh, we could start collecting the money uh, next year with more certainty um, and we could just kind of slide those numbers on a year uh, but the longer we take to come to a decision that's the longer our uh, RCMP will be operating with perhaps uh, infra in insufficient infrastructure to support their servicing. So they're a very important pillar of our community. Um, I want to support them but I want to support them in the right way. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Grove. Thank you very much. Um, I had a question. Yeah, sure I did. 2027, is that the year it's going to, uh, vaguely, I know that the building is due to be built, completed? Do you, does anybody recall from that presentation back in the day? Through your worship, uh, the options analysis anticipated 2026. Yeah, thank you. So, it seems to me that whatever the outcome, we're going to need to spend a big purchase. Uh, we're going to have to spend a lot of money. And I like the idea of getting on it right away. However, this year, 1.79, given the context of the overall budget, seems to me we could perhaps reduce it. I wouldn't remove it completely. I would think maybe reduce it by either 0.8 or down to 1.0 contribution uh, percent increase or uh, take away 1%, 0.79%. Uh, much like option two, uh, though I'm not sure I'd follow that particular uh, percentage increase path, increase path. It seems to me, I don't want to be sitting here in three, four years grinding my teeth on the fact that we didn't set aside money. It's going to come. We're going to need it. And we are in an inflationary climate. So these numbers in our budget in general are inflated somewhat this year for that reason. This is a reality we're all living with. We can't change that. And it seems to me to remove the money this year is perhaps we're rubbing Peter to pay Paul, as they say. So that's just my comment. Thank you very much, Councillor Grove. So I'll just, um, Councillor Jordison, no, uh, I'll just throw my, my two cents in here. Um, just understanding all the concerns around the table. I think there may be a compromise to this. And my compromise is, I mean, you clearly have two options, right? We can debt finance everything, you know, in the end, and it costs too much money to me. I, I just, I just hate paying. <laughs> I just hate paying interest myself personally. Um, or we could do, uh, you know, a, a save and pay, which we're trying to do right now. And so, but there might be a compromise instead of going with the 
for 1.79 if we were to say do one and see what happens this year, I guess. Because there's, there's another element in this that could come into play. I'm just saying could. I'm being very careful with my words here. Is that um, the infrastructure funding that we're supposed to be getting by the by March 31st uh, could be applied here? This is my understanding right now. So, you know, that's to the benefit of the taxpayers. So, you know, why couldn't it be used for that purpose? So, that decision has to be made when 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 we get it. So, there are other options here for us right now. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> I wasn't even reading that part of the slide. Um, oh, okay. Um, okay. I see. Sorry, go ahead. Jeff. Worship, if I may comment, uh, with respect to the recent uh, capital grant announcement, once we receive details, which we anticipate will be in the very near future, we will return to council um, for conversation and ultimately direction. Um, this absolutely could be how that grant is spent. Um, as you're aware, within this plan, there are many other areas um, where we could utilize that grant funding. Right. Just to take a step back, this proposed plan is so that we can ultimately be set up to service the debt. This plan does not propose that we are not using debt. Um, so our share of these works, upwards of $20 million, um, we do not have another alternative. So debt financing for the entirety of these works, as you can see, you know, we are proposing to set aside funds annually. We will likely have well over a million dollars that can be contributed towards these works, likely contribute to our proportionate share of the design, et cetera. Uh, but ultimately, the majority of the city spend on this facility upgrade will be debt financed. Now to take a moment to talk about the options. So the financial plan before you, it basically proposed, okay, we want to get to $1.3 million by year four. We're going to equally set aside the same increase in dollars every year. So $325,000 in year one, we're going to double that to $650,000 in year two. Then in year three, we're going to move to, <clears throat> excuse me, $975,000. So every year, it's an additional $325,000. That's what's within the plan before you, that's what's driving a year one tax increase of 1.79%. The option one is if we were to, okay, in year one, we'll set aside 20% of the amount, $260,000. Year two, we'll move to 40% of the amount. Year three, 60% of the amount. Year four, 80%. Year five, 100%. You know, the, the plan was originally drafted with the expectation uh, generated by the options analysis, which is that construction would be complete in the year 2026, year four. A second option um, is lifted for consideration, and that is, okay, in year one, we'll tax for 10% of the amount, $130,000. Year two, we'll move to 20%. Year three, 40%. Year four, 80% of that amount, and ultimately, move to the $1.3 million in year five. Okay, I understand this now. Guess we should have had the briefing on this before we started talking about it. <laughs> we, could have, we could have 20 options up on the screen for consideration. Um, so a 1% tax increase, that would set aside $180,000 this year. You're absolutely correct that as this year progresses, we will certainly get more information. As you heard our CAO say, um, we are looking for a decision to be made this year. Right. Please let me know if there's anything further I can provide. Um, okay, so I guess in the bottom line is, I, I mean, I like what you're saying, Councillor Jensen, but I just couldn't support a 0% because we're gonna get it on the, on the rear end, so it, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a great suggestion, but uh, I'm I'm more probably in favor of the uh, op option number two. But uh, um, I, I'd like to. Well, 
Okay. <laughs> Councillor Ward. If I may, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Maybe the same train of thought. Um, I, I was going to ask the question, Jen, and I think you already you hit it, is that there's a myriad of different options you can pursue here. Um, but in the interest of expediting things and being a little cautious in, in year one before we have certainty on, on what may even happen, what other funds may exist, I would lean towards the, the lower end, considering the tax burden we're already looking at this year. Um, so if I may, I'd like to amend Councillor Jansen's motion just to move from the original plan to option two um, with the option to revisit after the year one taxation. Okay, can I get a seconder on that motion? Uh, Councillor Gay, thank you. And uh, so you've motivated it, so I'll go to uh, Councillor well, Councillor Jordison. You put your hand down. Are you okay? Okay. Uh, Councillor Day. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank uh, Finance for doing um, a great job of guessing where our heads were going. So to, to lay out a couple of different options for us to consider, that, that's very good work. So thank you. Okay, that's great. So seeing no other, um, any other questions or comments, uh, I'll call the... Oh, do we? Okay, so what we were voting on is option number one right now, the amendment. So may I? Uh, option two, sorry, sorry. I haven't eaten yet. I need to eat. Um, so, uh, so I'll call the question, all those in favor of option number two? Okay, okay that's unanimous. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> That main motion, yes. Uh, and uh, I'll call the question on the main motion. Any other discussion on the main motion? See? Zero. Zero. But we amended it. We amended that right Oh, yeah. We Your Worship, if I may? Yes, please. I'm confused. We're Thank not. you. You just voted to uh, Councillor Ward's motion to amend Councillor Jansen's yes. motion. Right. The motion that's on the table now is option two. Right. <laughs> we're good. We're voting twice. Yeah, we're voting twice, twice on the same thing then, basically. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's too late. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's unanimous. Councilor Jordison, you're okay with that? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So we. Please continue. Okay, so with that, we will simply uh, start at the, the top of the, our series of service profiles. Um, as Council has previously resolved to maintain service delivery in all other areas, with the exception of the call with cleanup. So for administration and corporate services, the top three priorities are both within the draft plan and on the screen before you. This is your opportunity to recommend any changes if you wish. In addition, three special initiative budgets in this area. Corporate contingency. So this is a recurring line item that the city maintains within our financial plan. Administration will not utilize this contingency without a council resolution specifically directing the use of this contingency. Uh, but it enables us to react to expenditures that we have not planned for without having to bring forward a financial plan amendment. Last year's financial plan saw funding set aside to support electronic record scanning. That work is underway and will continue into this year. Lastly, we have funds set aside for the next municipal election. If council wishes to ask any questions of staff on the special initiatives, or make any recommended changes in terms of the top three priorities. Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Jens Jordison. Um, I just had a question in regards to the top three um, priorities. In the um, information that came before us in service delivery, um, it was listed to develop a respectful work workplace policy, and it's in 2022 and then it was placed in 2022 and now it's stating to review a code of conduct policy are those 
two different policies? Are they, are they one of the same or I'm just confused? Certainly, if I may jump in through your worship, top priority within the HR service area, which we'll get to momentarily, is with respect to the respectful workplace. Thank you so much. Please proceed. Council has directed that we maintain the level of service both within administration and corporate services. This is an opportunity to make any recommend, recommended changes. Uh, ultimately, all of these service areas are rolling up to drive the 3.7% tax increase for the overall maintenance of city services. Questions, comments? Okay, please proceed. Oops, Councillor Day. Just in regards to the council and committees, we have new committees that are currently forming, but we haven't actualized them yet. Um, do we have sufficient uh, budget for their management? The current ones that are about to commence um, are covered within this budget, but any additional ones are not. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'll just continue to move along and, and please pause me. Uh, so moving on to the area of communications, maintain level of service. We have lifted up for consideration six priorities that were outlined during service review. Those highlighted in blue um, are the top three that have been included within the draft financial plan. I'll pause should council have any recommended changes. Councillor Jordison. I know I was the instigator of um, helping with those uh, top three, but I'm just wondering if the activate volunteer program for events should be, should not be a priority and should just uh, uh, maybe the the next one uh, moves up or, or something, it's, it, just for discussion. Councilor Day. Yeah, so just in regards to that, um, I think, um, I mean, activating volunteer program for events is, is great and, and that's something that I certainly want to see us uh, try to take advantage of, uh, but it will be dependent on the right volunteers coming forward too. Uh, but I also think that um, there's such a challenge with social media that I think the evaluate the social media presence probably is more of a priority for us because that's more within our control. So I, I would certainly like to, um, uh, to elevate the, the social media uh, presence um, up. Staff, co uh, comment on that one, please. Your Worship, if I may make kind of a, a global comment. Yes. And then if uh, Ms. Russell's in the room, she could make a specific comment on these. And so while during the service review, the recommendation was that uh, in the area of priorities, we choose three such that we can be focused and effective. Uh, if council wanted four or five or six in a particular area, that's not uh, offside, if you will. <laughs> It's just that we'll be less focused on six than we would on three. But I'll have Ms. Russell speak to the specific question. I'm happy to take direction from council on this. Um, as um, CAO Robert Earl has said, we will focus on all six of the priorities. Um, the difference I think between evaluating our social media presence and activating a volunteer plan is that there's an investment um, required with our volunteer plan. The current volunteer plan as it stands um, recommends 
a, a position, a volunteer coordinator position um, to do it most effectively. That, of course, the plan needs to come to this council for um, review and we're planning to bring it. Um, those, that's a distinction, a, a, a quite significant distinction between the two options we're discussing right now. I'm not sure if that's helpful and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Okay, um, I'm okay with the, the, the uh, priorities as they are right now. The, the social media thing is, ah, geez. I don't have an answer for that. You know, it, it's, um, it depends on your, the, the demographic, the demography of your, of your population, right? And um, I just noticed that, uh, you know, I'm not an expert at it all, but I mean, I'm not even on social media. I, I'm just not. And um, I, I guess I represent this demographic that just stays away from it. I just can't be bothered with it. Um, I, I believe in the old fashioned way. If someone wants to call me, wants to meet me, then I'm more than happy. If they want to talk to me on the telephone, I'm more than happy. But whether I'm going to um, have a dialogue or debate over social media, I just absolutely refuse to. And it always ends up that way. And yet when you try to say, let's meet, they don't want to meet. So it's, it's a no win situation for me, but I know um, I'd be a fool not to say that it's not, it's the, that's it, that is the future. And, and I do understand that. And for some reason, we just can't seem to grab that, you know, that, that, that demographic group, you know, the 50 plus crowd in that social media crowd right now. Um, because I, I can tell you most of the people that I meet all the time are probably older people and they don't know what's going on because they don't engage. And you keep on saying, please engage. They just won't do it. It's, you know, they, anyways, I, I, yeah, I know how you feel about this and it's, I wish I, I had the solution for it. Please. I, may, um, I think when we talk about evaluating social media, it's where we spend our time on social media. And so we actually quite have a quite engaged and positive audience on our own page. Yes. It's whether we as a communications team invest time in going to the other pages, the other community pages where conversations are happening or do not and use that as information we're taking in or whether we respond. And those are some of the conversations I think we could talk about having. The other thing to your point about um, reaching various demographics, it's not our only tool in the toolkit, right? Yeah. Our um, newsletters, which are delivered directly to mailboxes, um, tend to be something that reaches the older demographic as well as our local newspaper, which, which comes to almost every public mailbox. So it's a balance between those various tools. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Grove. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Do you, do we have volunteer a list like a fact of people that you would call up if you need assistance with something? Not formally, actually. No, yeah. um, there are um, folks who tend to volunteer. What feels a little bit um, inequitable about that is that it doesn't give everyone the opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. It draws the energy of those who are willing more often than others. And so to have a really um, comprehensive approach would be beneficial. Right, I agree completely, and I think that the events, First Nations uh, relations, and the events that are happen around the building of trust with the, that community, as well as the idea of um, the work that we do as counselors. I mean, I go to events all the time. It feels like volunteer work. I know I'm paid, but it's uh, it feels like volunteer work sometimes. But it's something that I relish and I enjoy it. I think we all do. And the community, if we can get that rolling, it hopefully will grow, yeah? So then we have this kind of organic basis of activity that I think that the benefits to the budget then are huge. So that to leave it as a priority to me where you might spend a bit more time assuming more money, like a coordinator, it makes sense to me. As to the other things, um, I, I think that I understand you'll be doing all those things anyway as a focus. Uh, um, that we're talking about tonight, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Olson. Hope you can hear me through my mask. Okay. Um, just a question about the volunteer program. Is that going to be a new position that's going to be offered 
in the communications department, like hiring somebody full time, part time, just trying to get a sense of the investment there. Right. So unfortunately, you haven't seen um, the plan that was deferred by the previous council, but it does recommend a full time position. There would be room in that to think about, um, you know, whether we want to phase in that approach, but it does recommend uh, a full time position and the cost estimate when the plan was first presented was $80,000 a year by the time you've funded that position fully. Right. Okay, thank you. I think these top three priorities make sense to me. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any um, motions here to change them. So let's continue. So moving along, we are looking at the third and final year of our Callwood marketing campaign budget, uh, household prosperity census and survey, as you're aware, that is in progress. And we have the carry forward funding to support that. Oh, Councillor Day. Can you just tell us, uh, the Colwood marketing campaign, is, is that trying to attract uh, businesses or is it um, showcasing existing businesses? Thank you. So it has been a mixed bag and that's a conversation we've had continuously throughout the program. Uh, originally, it was talking about attracting residents because um, we had a lot of building going on and uh, when you have a, a, a you know body heat, it will attract businesses. Is the theory? In reality, much of the marketing we did was geared toward businesses. So we did the Times Colonist um, feature pages quarterly, uh, and those we invited local business to advertise alongside it, and often at a subsidized rate. Um, so we were supporting, supporting and promoting local businesses while trying to demonstrate to other businesses in the region that this is a supportive place and a place that's happening. Um, so that was part of it. But part of our marketing uh, campaign budget goes toward the videos we're producing to, to inform and engage residents and put a positive and um, familiar face to staff in the city. Um, it's about photography to, to you know, using all our marketing. It's about our banner campaign on the growing number of streets we have. Um, throughout Callwood, you know, new new banners now along at the Allendale District and, and in the Royal Bay community. Um, so quite a mixed um, uh, toolkit of marketing. It's about our lighting. So we have the Starburst banner um, lighting uh, frames, which we had to increase the order of this year because we have more streets to put them on and more park space. So many things in that budget. Yeah. It's a significant budget amount uh at least in my opinion uh and and i i would like to hear more as you develop it um so that we can help to shape it in ways that that um that represent this council's view thank you for that and some of the ideas we that's exactly what we will look for this year's direction from council about how to focus that budget um thinking about perhaps working with our leasing partners um, through ANI and through PCRE and, and Gable Craft on what do they need to help attract the kind of businesses that council would like to see coming to our community. And so maybe having some engagements like that and then rolling out a program um, to see that through those sorts of ideas. And so with that, page 34, the draft financial plan contains the operating budget to support the maintenance of service delivery in this area. Pause for any questions, otherwise we'll move on to human resources. Councillor Jordison. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions here. I'm just wondering under the, um, the line for event sponsorship, I'm wondering if there is a threshold for that um, revenue generation. Like is there, is there can we, um, like what number does it stop at? Because with that, um, also increases, uh, you know, the other service uh, the expenses under events and public relations and such. So I'm just just curious about that. Thank you for that question. I think that we have not reached the threshold for sponsorship. Last year, um, we learned that there's a lot of interest in sponsoring COVID events. Uh, we are seeing that same interest this year, and I think we could sharpen our program um, just to make 
local businesses and partners more aware of those opportunities. Also beyond Colwood's borders, uh, I, I think that there are lots of businesses who would be interested in, um, uh, you know, showcasing their offerings to the growing West Shore. So um, we're eager to get started on a sponsorship program. So uh, looking forward to some certainty about our events program so that we can do that. And I think my goal is to at least double last year's sponsorship revenue um, and see if we can do that. Sorry, so I'm not understanding. There's there's not a budget for it then because if, if the sky's the limit, then the other, it increases expenses throughout the rest of the budget with uh, event sponsorship comes putting on these events and, and costs are incurred. So there's no limit, the size the limit, is that what I'm understanding? Thank you, sorry for that um, misrepresentation. I think that what we would do with more event revenue is uh, bring down the cost of, of the services we provide. So it could work two ways. Um, for example, last year, one of our sponsors um, a requirement of the sponsorship was to bring a larger act to one of our events, uh, but we could certainly um, design our sponsorship program to um, meet the needs of our current event offerings. So, for example, um, you know, have a business pay for the band that we've already booked for the event so that we're lowering our expenses on events. Um, to a more break-even level rather than expanding. Last year's events program was a little bit unique in that it was a return to events after two years of um, reduced spending on events due to COVID. And so it was a bit of a, a bump in the year, but I'm not sure that we would see that same uh, activity this year if we continue with the same program. Okay. And then I just have another, I just have one other question. Um, I, throughout this whole budget process, I've been trying to, um, or at least hopes of lowering the percentage of tax increase to the to the residents. And um, I'm just um, suggesting that maybe this year, since last year's Eats and Beats event, um, you know, costs about 55,000, I was, um, I just wanted to suggest that maybe this year we take a temporary hiatus with this event um, to reduce this budget um, cost to taxpayers at the end. and. Also to propose that the, the city lower the amount of events for music in the park and beach events this year, or maybe run it from May to September and only do seven events and cut that budget in half. I'm, you know, I, I think that there's some savings here that we could get for the taxpayer, but still provide um, something for everybody. I don't know if you need that in a motion or what. I, I guess what concerns me here is the budget for communications is sitting at costing taxpayer $16.29 per resident. And when you compare that to like budgets for storm storm sewers and you know where it's $13, it, it just seems a little unbalanced. Would you like to make a, a motion then, Councilor Jordison? Yeah, I'm not really sure how to, well, I'd like to make a motion to um, suggest that uh, we not proceed with eats the, the large eats and beats event this year. Um, last year it was scheduled July 30th. I don't know um, when it's planned for, and that um, we reduce the uh, amount of events for music in the park and beach events this year to to seven events. And I, I say that just like um, just because I was looking at maybe only on Saturday evenings and exclude the two holiday weekends. I mean, we're still offering it, but we're, you know, being cognizant of what we're spending. Can I just get a clarification, uh, um, Sandra? Is like, like these uh, music in the park, it's, uh, if I remember right, it's every Friday and Saturday night, correct? Last year, we offered music in the park every Friday through yeah. May, mid-May to the beginning of September and Saturday nights. Uh, at the beach. At the beach, right. Yep. So there was always something Friday and Saturday. That's right. Days. Okay. Yep. And, and and just one other question, because uh, we're talking about this this motion here, but uh, just want to clarify in my own head too, is um, what where, where does the revenue go from these guys that have businesses on the beach? Where, where, where is that showing? 
like what I'm talking about is the uh, is that the is that the first one the beach event permit revenue is that is that what that is and it's also included is that other that sauna guy that's down there right now that's in that number right there right <laughs> Uh, you're correct. For the food vendors, they pay a permit fee for the season. Okay. Uh, the sauna operator is a different uh, situation. He has a temporary um, special event permit and a call with business license, uh, uh, but has not paid a permit fee, has not been asked to pay a permit fee um, as, a, as a temporary right of way to see if the community is interested in that is how I understand it. So where does that money go? Where, where, do you, so you're getting a revenue for that right now, right? Where, where does that go? Business license fee revenue is included within the corporate services oh, gotcha. profile that ultimately supports the operating costs of the city. Okay. My head's hurting on that one because um, I thought we had a... I thought we had a bylaw that says you couldn't run a business down on the beach. And yet we got a business running down on the beach. If I may, our CAO has asked me to prepare a briefing note on that one and bring it to council so that we can get some guidance on how to deal with situations like that. <sighs> okay, so I wasn't far off on that one. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, that's, uh, that's an aside, but it, it was just, I was wondering you know, 3,800. So the motion is uh, from Councillor Jordison is to look at doing half the number. Did you say Councillor Jordison? I, I just want to make sure. Yes. I'm clear. Yeah, sorry. I was um, suggesting that um, if it was just run on Saturday evenings, it'd be a mix of, you know, in the park, music in the park or the beach or whatever, just from July and August. So cutting it down to seven events on Saturday evenings, excluding the two holiday weekends. In July and August, okay. and then the and then just um, proceeding proposing with proceeding uh, with uh, not having the the larger eats and beats event this year. Okay. I, yeah. Um, do I have a second here so we can discuss this? Okay, Councillor Day will second that motion. I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Olson. I just saw your hand go up here. Would you, would you like to discuss the motion or, or oh, okay I'll tell you what i'll uh, I, we've got the motion i'll let i'll let you answer, ask your question councillor Olson. i just had a question as far as what the attendance is generally like on the friday and saturday my stomach hurts when i think about taking things away that people enjoy doing um so by going just to a Saturday, I mean, what are we taking away from families and the people, the public that are going out and attending these events? Are they well attended, in your opinion, on the Fridays and the Saturdays? Thanks for that question. Uh, we estimate about 200 people come out to the Friday night uh, music and then between 300 and, depending on the band, 500 at the beach on the Saturday night with the food trucks there. Um, and we get really good feedback about it uh, for the most part. So that's and just another question to that. So on the Fridays, the, the music in the parks moved to various parks around the community, correct? So those 200 people perhaps are people from those sort of little nooks and crannies. Yeah. That's right. We tend to, at Cowan Creek Park, the <coughs> neighboring homes, we tend to see those neighbors come out and often bring their barbecues over. And same with Fern Williams, you, you get to recognize the faces so that we're touching um, each neighborhood. So do you, do you attend these events? Like every, like there's staff at every single event, I'm assuming? Yes, between myself and Brittany, our engagement assistant, one of us is generally there to liaise with the band and set up the equipment. <laughs> Uh, Councilor Grove on the motion. Are you talking to the motion right now? I can. Okay, perfect. Councilor Grove. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, personal opinions aside about the uh, beach events, because it I understood to be a protected habitat. And I think there's parks, people in the community that have spoken to me about the use of it, and the generators running and the trucks and the exhaust from the uh, grills and so on. Um, aside from that, 
I, I recognize that a lot of people really enjoy it. And I think perhaps in a different location, I would feel better about that part of it. But that's my uh, reflecting what a lot of people have, but not a lot, I should just not qualify it like that. Um, I, I do hear that concern. Um, I, I understand too that a lot of families on tight budgets and in this environment right now, I think a lot of people are scratching the dollars together and to remove what is essentially a free entertainment uh, to me is kind of antisocial. I think I would not support the um, motion on that basis alone while recognizing that it'd be great to find, I think a better location. I don't know where that would be. I haven't really thought about it that much. It's just a concern. And so I think I've said my bit. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Day. Thank you. So I, I think I'm trying to achieve kind of a balance. Uh, so my perception is that, that events are, are really important. Um, they're an awful lot of work. And of the events, I believe that the Fridays are the least well attended. Um, and, and so I like that we have music in our parks. I like that it brings out different neighborhoods to um, enjoy that and that it's free and that if you're really into it, you can visit different neighborhoods, that's, that's great. Um, but I also, uh, I really feel, and, and uh, I've certainly heard from residents, um, that Esquimalt Lagoon uh, events have been getting almost too big. Um, they're, they're sort of, you know, it's a beautiful environment, and that's not why people are there. Um, so I'm trying to find a way, and I think this motion is uh, going a long ways to supporting um, keeping free public events done in Colwood for people to attend, but kind of managing our budget by not spreading ourselves too thin and also talking, you know, naming the elephant in the room that, that um, you know, uh, the beach uh, Esquimalt Lagoon is maybe uh, not the ideal location for what's been happening there. Uh, so I, I'm trying to walk that careful line, not take too much away, uh, but also um, keep, keep our beautiful beach beautiful and natural uh, as much as we can. So I'm, I'm in support of the motion. Thank you, you. Councilor Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I mean, we do have a, you know, in, in deference to Councillor Day and to Councillor Jordison's motion, there is a, a divide in the community, I think, that Councillor Grove also referenced, you know, around events at the beach and so on. But I'm of the mind that the right place long term for a large scale event is it exists, it's just not developed yet. It's Royal Beach, right? And I think many people I talk to understand that, that some of the things we do at the lagoon can have a permanent home when, when we have the, the place to put them. Uh, but in the interim, the question becomes, do you kill off something that's, that's popular uh, or do you allow it to, to build, constrain its growth until such time as you move it over? And, you know, I'm of the mind that, you know, maybe Friday and Saturday is, is too much, but not for the same reason, not because I want to cut, you know, a few dollars off, off the budget. Um, it's because, you know, maybe we, we just focus on Saturdays and we can do a little bit more, do it a little bit better, a um, little less time invested by the staff so you can really put on a, a truly fantastic event and, and move them around the community so it, it isn't focused in just one area. Um, you know, Eats and Beats, I initially wasn't sure about it. I've attended as a normal citizen, I guess, before elected. And, and you know, I saw a lot of people having a great time. And, and you know, Councillor Day, with respect, I think a lot of people go there for twofold reasons. Like, I would go there with my family. We would walk from Royal Beach down the beach to get a walk in, enjoy the fresh air, grab some dinner or an ice cream or something. But we're taking in the surroundings and things and using the fledgling trail that's there to, to get back. So different people attend for different reasons. And I think we have to be cognizant of the environmental impact and, and the location and constrain the, the size of it, but to, to kill it off and, and look to restart many years down the road when we've, we've invested the time and energy and people enjoy it. I, I'm not 
supportive of that, quite frankly. Um, I also um, believe that social infrastructure matters. The events that I've attended in Colwood at uh, Herm Williams Park at Christmas time, and, and you know, you saw it in City Hall at, at Christmas as well. People coming out of COVID are looking to reconnect with that sense of community and belonging. And social infrastructure is an important way to do that. And it exists in many forms in rec centers, libraries, fields, but it's community planned events that don't really hit the individual pocketbook that hard. So you can walk down with your family, you know, and, and take in some music or grab a bite to eat from a food truck. And uh, I think to do away with that at this juncture, just you end with a sterile community that, that doesn't offer a whole lot. So, you know, uh, unfortunately I can't support the motion. Um, I would support like I say, lining up the events on a on a singular date on a Saturday just to be able to provide a more robust experience. But that's that's where I draw the line. Yes, please. Councillor Day. So um, if Councillor Jorgensen is okay with it, then I would like to spool it this motion and suggest that we vote separately on the eats and beats and separately on music in the park being Saturdays only. Yeah, uh, is there a seconder for that motion? Mm -hmm. Oh, Councillor Jordison, yeah, oh yeah, right. Councillor Jordison, are you, are you okay with that? Yes, um, I just had something to add. Do you want me to do that now? Yes, please. So I, I just think it's important to note that in this budget already, staff time is not in this budget. So there's no um, costing been done to show what we are spending on staff time in this budget. It's it's noted at the bottom that, well, it's not noted there, but um, the cost for the communications of public works support is not part of this budget as it sits right in front of us, as far as I understand. Also, um, I, I just think it's important to understand that the Eats and Beats event that I'm referring to is not the every Friday or whatever it is down at the lagoon. It's the very large event that happened last year on July 30th that cost us $55,000. I just think that that amount is um, much too large for such a little city. You know, like I, I just, there's better ways to spend um, tax dollars and and uh, you know, on maybe some littler events or or a few other ones or something like that. So that's what I'm referring to when I say that one event. Um, and yeah, I was just suggesting that we just maybe we don't start these events in June and go till September. We just do July and August. Or I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Point. Yes. Go ahead. Which I just have a point of order that I need staff to rule on that um, it was referred back to Councillor Jordison if she was okay with making a change to the motion. And from what I understand in the rules of order, when a motion has been tabled, it belongs to the table. And it, it isn't owned by any one individual. So if there's a motion to amend, that's fine. But it's not a decision made by the original uh, councillor who's made the motion. I... Oh, he's absolutely right, yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right on that one. Smack on. It's, I, it was just, uh, I guess it's a consideration for the mover of, of a motion that they're all right with one suggestion. We split it because I was only the second. Right. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jensen. Yeah, thank you, Worship. I am in favor of absolutely no part of this uh, and I think that we got to where we are at through a lot of dialogue and trying to build up our activities in the city and I guarantee you that this connects directly back to our strategic plan so I'm not sure what we're trying to achieve here if we're trying to you know trim a little bit around the edges I guess that's one way to approach it eats and beats puts this community on the map all this, uh, you know, I, I get there's some sensitivities to the environment down there. The federal park rangers were there this year. They walked the beach. I, a whole lot of zero came from them as far as concerns to the city. Um, so, you know, we're all over the map here. 
Uh, and quite frankly, the Friday is well attended. I go to for them Friday after work and there's a couple hundred people there having a good time. And that's what community is about. And when we're talking about sort of fiddling a little bit here with a few bucks here and there. I, I mean, I don't think it's even worth the discussion. These are well-received um, well received events in the community uh, that everybody loves. And I think that, uh, that we, we run the risk of facing more criticism by canceling portions of it or amending it to any great degree uh, than we would uh, as far as gaining capital, as far as reducing the budget uh, slightly, ever so slightly. Those are my thoughts. I'm going to be opposed to all of it, whether we sever or do it in a batch or what, what have you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jordison. Sorry, we didn't let you finish. All right. Um, about the coin order, I just wanted to say that I did say yes to Cynthia, but, or sorry, to Councillor Day that it was fine to split the motion. I did answer that and then I just provided some extra information. So I don't anyway. Um I just I just think we need to look at this. This isn't a little bit of money, this is a lot of money. And I think that we need to look at what we can say for the you know for our citizens. I I just think that this is a opportunity to um save some money and to lower the uh tax increase. Thank you. I do understand the spirit that you're doing this in right now. I do. Um, you know, it's um, tough times for some other people, some people in our community. Uh, I've seen the gamut right now. Some people it's not affecting, some people it is affecting. And uh, uh, we would have to be totally ignorant if we're just going to ignore uh, all facets because we're supposed to represent all COVID here. So, I mean, there, there's great opinions here. Um, I'm, I'm more of the kind of a guy that looks at it and sort of you know, because as you know, I always attended Friday and Saturdays, try to anyways, whenever there's cooking, I was there. I was always shafted to do the cooking. And so I was always there. And I know right now, just my own experience, and you're, you're probably right, uh, Sandra, about the, the number of people that attend. Saturday nights were always bigger, always bigger. And Fridays were just not because people are getting off work and and they're a little bit late getting there. And uh, so the Saturday nights were great. I would never ever want to take it away. That's for sure. Um, I, would, I would love to see, unfortunately, some of the, the big days to me that we don't celebrate is like Canada Day. I, I don't understand why we have no celebration. And, you know, to me, that's a big thing. Uh, the BC Day, you know, why don't we do things for those? Like to me, to do the events around those themes right now are great. You know, there, there are pride. So that, that's my only, uh, my, my biggest observation. But I, I do respect this on one side of the fence right now. Um, there is, um, you know, people are, are suffering from inflation. We have to, you know, we have to be aware of it. Jeez, I mean, you know, I get my own wife whacking me in the head about groceries right now and I can't make the meals that I always make, you know, it's, it's, it, it, you were feeling the pinch all around. So I'm cognizant of that. And uh, so I, I clearly understand the motivation behind this. You know, it's, it's, it, it is at the right motivation. Um, and it's a harsh thing. And the unfortunate part, as you said, uh, Councillor Jensen, it's once you've done it now and to take that away now, oh, geez, we'll, we'll suffer the wrath. You know, I, I know that I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very aware of that. <clears throat> but should council decide, you know, that that that's the way we want to go, I will take the wrath. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm a big boy and I will take it. But um, so I, I'm sort of sitting on the fence on this one, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I do, like I said, would I think that we're just not acknowledging things that we should like Canada Day, like at least Canada Day, maybe not BC Day, but Canada Day would be a pretty phenomenal thing to do, something here. Um, saves people from driving downtown. So uh, so we do have a motion right now. I don't see any other comments and we've got to move on this. I'm going to call the question. Um, those in favor, okay, so uh, can we get a, a could you please read out what the motion is, please? Um, okay, the motion is that Colwood Eats and Beats not proceed in 2023 and that the number of music in the park events be reduced 
to seven only Saturday evenings in July and August and exclude holiday weekends. things I wanted. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll call that. I'll call the question. Did everyone hear? Okay. That we didn't have the motion. We had the motion. We did. We didn't have the motion to sever, did we? we did we have the motion to sever? I just want to confirm. We didn't have that. a motion to sever. There was an amendment, but there was a point of order, and um, I think wow. the best way to go about it is to have a motion to sever, and then we can move forward. I'd just like to make the motion to sever. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Okay, Councillor Jensen. Thank you very much. So on, on, on the motion to sever discussion, all those in favor, okay, opposed? Okay. Councilor Jordison, Councilor Ward? And, and, <laughs> it's just about whether we vote twice, whether twice. we vote on oh, music yeah. in the park, and, 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 and each and beats. Okay. And then separately vote on each and beats. beats. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Go ahead. Council Ward. I'd like some clarity on, on the second. The, the first part of the motion is very clear. The motion is to cancel E's and B's for this year, right? The second motion is to reduce the music in the park to seven, excluding holiday weekends. What is the, it is strictly a motion to cut it to that? There is no motion to reallocate expenses or anything with that or this is just strictly a motion to cut it to seven and that's it. That's exactly what it is right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so on the on the motion to sever, those uh, those in favor, okay, so, so we're just separate. Yeah, we're just separating the motion right now. So we're, we're, we're making the motion to, yeah, two motions. Yeah, split the events. No. Correct. That's why I want them typed up. <laughs> okay, on the motion to, to sever now, so we're trying to get down to this vote. All those in favor, thank you. Okay, any opposed to sever? Councilor Grove and Councilor Jordison, uh, I didn't see how you voted, sorry. I'm sorry, what, what is the motion to sever what? It's just to sever the eats and beats from the music in the park. So we're going to vote on them separately. So the eats and beats event, the large one, is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So to sever we're just to bring the motion, and we're going to vote separately on both. Okay. Okay. So it's just a severing. Okay. So you four are against the severing. To sever it from um to sever the it's original split. motion. Yes. That's get, all. That's all the motion is right now. To, to sever, sever it. Yes. To sever the yes. two. Okay, so it's just the uh, council growth that opposed. Okay, so uh, discussion on, okay, so the, the, the motion on um, canceling eats and beats is, is, is the motion that I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna bring up right now. So we, we need to have, do we need to re have a mover and seconder on that? Okay, so we don't have to do that. Okay, so uh, discussion on that, any discussion? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question on this one. Those in favor of canceling eats and beats uh, for this year, um, those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, Councillor Jordison and Councillor Day. So the that motion is defeated. Okay, on the motion on music in the park to reduce it down to seven, Councillor Jordison, excluding holidays. I think I believe that was the motion, correct? Amanda. Amanda. So the motion is that the number of music in the park events be reduced to seven, only Saturday evenings in July and August and exclude holiday weekends. So there wouldn't be um, holiday weekend events. It would only be Saturdays in July and August. Okay, so just, okay, so I'm gonna open it up Yes. On the last vote. 
Councilor Grove. On, on the last vote, there were two voters indicated, or two votes indicated. The rest of us didn't, which means we voted yes, right? Because an abstention or not motion means yes. How do you, because you didn't vote in I favor. But those in favor. But you didn't call for opposed. Do you not need to do yes, that? Yes, I did. Point? And then you stuck up your hand. No, it was okay. I didn't raise oh. my hand for that. This very most recent vote. You were opposed to separate. Oh, yeah, you were opposed yeah, to Yeah, I'm talking about this one about the eats and beats. You didn't call for the opposed. I understand. Did you? Yes. Did we record who? So, opposed? what do we have? Can you please read what we have in the record, please? This is falling apart. So, um, the motion was defeated that Eats and Beats not proceed in 2023. And those who were in favor were Councillor Jordison and Councillor Day, yeah. which means um, I think your intention was that. Councillor Grove, Mayor Kobayashi, Councillor Ward, Councillor Olson, and Councillor Jansen were opposed, which the motion would be defeated. I understood that if we don't vote, it's uh, yes. Yes, it, it's opposite. I think we just did. Just Is it because? Opposite. Okay. Yeah. I think you. Just okay. Thank you. Heard something that we should. If you don't raise your hand, you're in favor of something. So Not I raising your hand implies a yes vote. Yes. I didn't raise my hand, but I was waiting to vote no, but I wasn't able to because it wasn't called. That's what I'm talking about. Because I, yeah, Which means the two that raised their hand voted yes, but the four that didn't raise their hand also voted yes. Okay. Uh, the, the motion was all those in favor of canceling each meets for 2023. Correct. But I was opposing. I wanted to oppose it. But because I didn't raise my hand, so that's were, taken as a yes. Opposed. I was going to vote no. Okay, so you're so let the record show that Councillor Grove voted <laughs> in no opposition. in opposition to canceling eats and beats. Eats and beats. Right. So everybody else who didn't raise their hand also. Well, no, the question was mm -hmm. those opposed to canceling Eats and Beats for 2023, all those in favor? Two raised their hand or three? No, every, everybody did. And, and I thought you did too. Those and those that were, yeah, so I said it wrong. Oh, then. Nice. I did say it wrong then because I should have said, yeah, I said it backwards. Okay. So are you opposed to the eats and beats? I think that we should leave everything alone. So yes, I'm opposed to, to removing eats and beats. Okay, so that's how it's recorded right now. Is that how it's recorded? But because I didn't raise my hand? Why was it that I didn't raise my hand? It was because Mayor Kobayashi asked the question, who is in favor and the people that raised their hand he said who was in favor nobody so that assumes then that everybody else is opposed no no I asked the next it was just, question yeah i didn't hear and two right. two hands went up that was concert days and concert george i i think it was just a, a confusion he was, well, he it was confusing yeah. yes okay i'll rest my case but i still anyway okay. but it's recorded correctly yeah well, i fair. believe right so the second question is uh, Re reducing the number of music in the parks to seven and only in the months of July and August, excluding and excluding the holiday weekends. That's correct, uh, corporate officer. Perfect. Thank you very much. So any discussion on this one? Okay, make sure I, I do this in a positive fashion. Those in favor of the motion. Please raise your hand. Councillor Day and Councillor Jordison. Those opposed. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. That's Councillor Grove, Mayor Kobayashi, Councillor Ward, Councillor Olson, and Councillor Jensen. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I, I know uh, it's all great intentions, 
but you know, I just thought about this for a little while and it's just tough to take away things that you started, unfortunately. So tough. How many, how many music, just, just, uh, just a quick aside here. How many of those uh, music fests do we actually hold in, in a year normally? Uh, my print is very small. I think there are 16 okay. music in the park events. Okay, so yeah, that would have been half. Yes, I haven't had supper tonight, so I'm dying. Yeah. Yes, we have a. Let's do a. Let's do a, a five minute break here. <laughs>
just one quick question. Um, do we, are we not required to do a, a policy on this thing called EDI, equity, diversity, inclusivity? Do you know offhand? Um, I don't believe there's any uh, specific requirements okay. uh, at this point, but that is uh, something that certainly we can explore if that's, uh, if there's a desire. Okay, thank you very much. If there's no recommended changes in this area, we'll move on to finance. Amanda, my clicker's letting me down. Top three priorities for finance are before you, and we do have two new special initiatives in this area. Uh, so as you've heard previously, we are working on an update to the city's sustainable infrastructure replacement plan. We are in the preliminary stages of this work and it will continue into this year. Um, and we are pleased that we have received some grant funding to support this work. Uh, in addition, we heard from council the desire to explore the use of performance metrics. And so we have brought forward some funding to support that initiative because we will be looking for some outside help on this. Uh, so these two special initiatives proposed for the area of finance. Any questions or recommended changes? Otherwise, I'll move forward. Area of IT. Three priorities are before you. No special initiatives in this area, as um, much of the work outside of CORE is focused on that of our capital program that we discussed earlier this week. You no know, recommended changes, we'll move on to the area of GIS. As you know, newly established corporate wide function, top three IS priorities are before you. Um, and again, no special initiatives in this area given the focus uh, related to the city's capital plan and that of new software implementation. Pending no recommended changes, we'll move along. Area of fire. So we are looking at two special initiatives, seeking grant funding to support both of these and the top three priorities are before you. Any comment or recommended changes in this area? Moving into the area of building and bylaw, we have no special initiatives to review with you. Priorities are before you. Pause for any questions or recommended changes in this area. Thank you. I don't know if it fits in this area, but I did ask for more information on our ability to understand our geotechnical issues, especially as they relate to buildings as well as um, development. Um, and since there's nothing new planned, uh, that I'm just wondering if we have anything planned to address uh, our ability to understand geotechnical issues. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Day, we do have uh, a program coming forward in engineering with respect to our retaining structures. We could add to that program. Uh, uh, a narrative to see if it answers your question in this area. It sorry, is, I didn't quite hear the name of the program. Sorry, it is with respect to the retaining walls that we have. So it's an inspection and an ongoing program to manage risk yeah. for those. We could, through that conversation, try to determine if we can develop a narrative that answers the questions you're seeking here. Yeah, because we, we have some historical areas in Colwood where uh, building is proposed for and some of the prior uses may affect uh, future uses. Sorry, thank you for that correction. So that, that area would clearly fit uh, within the building department. So we'll add that as a area of attention. Okay, thank you. Sorry, moving into the area of community planning and perhaps I'll have our director of community planning come forward. There are a number of special initiatives in this area. Uh, they are outlined in your financial plan. Starting on, I believe it's about page 70. So we are introducing a multi-year budget 
to support climate action initiatives, we will be utilizing grant funding uh, to support this work. Coastline Studies is an initiative that was previously endorsed and is in progress. Pause if you have any questions on either of these initiatives. Councillor Day. Thank you. So for the Climate Action Initiatives, uh, I'm just uh, very concerned uh, I recently learned that our um, tree bylaw is being implemented differently than how I understood, and that affects our carbon sequestration in Colwood. And I just would like to know how this fits with our climate action initiatives. Thank you for that question, Councilor Day and through his worship. Certainly, our urban forest has uh, a lot to do with our climate resilience and um, issues such as um, urban heat islands and uh, how we respond to expected higher temperatures. Uh, I can't uh, speak to the details of how the uh, low carbon resiliency plan would, would get into the area of um, changes to our, our tree bylaw. I'd have to look into that further. However, I would suggest that um, a more pertinent pertinent um, initiative would be our urban forest um, initiative and the plan that's forthcoming with a strategy to better manage our urban uh, forest canopy. Um, I expect that that uh, project will result in recommendations to potentially change the, our, our current approach to um, tree, our tree bylaw and tree cutting. Um, and that's expected uh, sometime later in 2023. Awesome, thank you. Colwood Gateway Visioning uh, is an initiative that is in progress and underway, as well as the Colwood Land Use Bylaw Update. I'll pause if there are any questions on either of these two initiatives. Councillor Day. So on the, sorry. So on the uh, Gateway Visioning, um, it, the exercise uh, uh, was um, brought forward to engage the public. Uh, but changes that were requested to the plan were not made last time I looked at it. Has that been updated? Thank you for that question, through His Worship. The plan that's currently on the Let's Talk Callwood website is the plan that Callwood endorsed. We haven't made the edits that um, would be uh, potentially recommended through uh, our uh, processing of the input we received. Um, we are presenting to um, a local mayor's group uh, tomorrow and also we'll be coming back to council with a what we heard report as well as any recommended changes uh, that would be inherent in in a second draft and we hope to be back in front of council in march and April, or april with that okay and you will be engaging with council following that engagement is that your plan Yes, yeah, so really the next step is to come back to council with the report on what we heard from stakeholders in the public uh, and with any recommendations for amendments to the plan. Okay, so yeah, because from, from my perspective, we, we did already try to make some, some changes and um, found that to be difficult. So uh, I'm having a hard time having faith in the process um, since it, it seems difficult to, um, to alter. Colwood Waterfront Public Realm Plan is a previously approved initiative that is in progress. Uh, you'll recall two months ago, Council's resolved to provide a grant to the Hooliton Family and Community Services Society. So we have that grant budget included here. And we have um, received some grant funding to support a community safety and well being initiative um, that will ultimately see us administer the spend of these funds through a, through a third party. Pause, should you have any questions for these initiatives? Reoccurring initiative is that of funding a demographic study. We have a multi year budget scheduled for that. 
slated for later in the financial plan, we have funding set aside for environmental sustainability initiatives next year, and the following year funding set aside for economic development initiatives with respect to the Royal Roads lands. I'll pause for questions here. Councilor Ward. Quick question. Oops. Quick question. Um, on the Royal Roads lands piece, um, I suspect I know the answer, but are those grant monies transferable if, in fact, it was determined that that was, a, let's say, an irrelevant endeavor? Through your worship, thank you for that question. Specifically, the city has a little over a million dollars of the Safe Restart grant left. That said, um, the conditions on which we can recognize the use of that grant have fully been met. Um, so one of those conditions is foregone revenues in recent years. It's my expectation when we are before you uh, with an update with respect to the 2022 financial statements, we will be proposing full recognition of that funding and simply moving it over to general surplus because we've met the conditions and as such, we can use it um, as a funding source for really anything um, pertaining to our general operations, which would be eligible for these works. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Inland floodplain mapping is an initiative that is underway and in progress. Similarly, the Latoria, the VMP to Wishart visioning exercise is one that is in progress. 2025 proposes a budget to support Gateway Public Realm Plan, uh, which was previously approved uh, in last year's financial plan. Pause, should there be any questions on these initiatives? Councilor Kate. Thank you. On the uh, Latoria to um, uh, VMP to Wishart visioning project, um, uh, this is money being used to engage consultants, um, but we still don't seem to have a clear understanding of the geotechnical issues there. So um, I, I'm just having a great deal of trouble where we're planning something without knowing if that's a viable um, option. Through Excellent. your worship uh, to Councillor Day. So the visioning exercise is an exercise to engage consultants in a land use uh, planning exercise that will have some financial feasibility in terms of the, the density and the land uses that would enable realizing the expansion or, or the extension of Latoria Road as it's envisioned between uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway and Wishart Road through that stretch. So it is, it is an exercise of what is the land use, um, the density, the height that would enable the um, expansion of the roadway as part of the development of those lands. So it will include consideration for a road network um, proposed densities, but it doesn't go to the level of detail of doing geotechnical or environmental investigations on behalf of those property owners. It will take into consideration that there are substantial um, concerns about geotechnical and environmental, and it will speak to an overall intent of how, how do we provide uh, a density and a vision that could be realized through further investigation that will be taken on um, by the property owners as they come forward with a proposal that meets that vision. So for instance, if it were to be determined that it's townhomes or that it is, um, six story apartment buildings or that the building typology that would support that um, road dedication and relocation of the creek needs to be more um, an, a more intense land use than what is currently envisioned through the uh, neighborhood hillside designation, then it, it will be then up to the property owners to come forward with an application that meets that vision that land use intent, and then provide the rationale and investigation on their lands for how it would be realized. 
Right. So, uh, but I, it, it, the cart is definitely before the horse here. Uh, we are talking about uh, a majority of that area that is wetland and peat bog. And uh, we are talking about uh, painting pretty pictures of it to imagine what could be there. And we need, uh, we just need to understand what the land can actually support. Uh, and we've already been through this uh, with uh, another site in that area on the corner of, of uh, Wishart and, and Latoria. So um, I just cannot support $30,000 on a planning exercise uh, where we don't have any facts to put, to put underneath it to hold it up. So Ed, I would like to propose a motion that this be removed from the budget. Can I get a seconder to that motion? I'll stick up my hand just to get discussion on this. Okay, okay, I'll, okay. Well, Con Councilor Jordison, I'll give you the second on this one, and then I'm just going to open it up for discussion right now. You want to? Uh, you've motivated. Do you want anything to add to it, uh, Councilor Day? Well, I think you've you've heard my my story before. Uh, there was a, a project that was approved. Uh, it's it's been to court. Uh, it, it affected the neighboring landowner. Uh, it, it has changed hands many times. It has not been successful. Uh, and um, there, there are serious concerns that the area was designated in the local area plan prior to us having an OCP as undevelopable land. And uh, so I, I just think we need to spend our money wisely. Uh, Councilor Jordison, do you want to add anything as a seconder to that? Yeah, certainly. I, I agree with, uh, with Councilor Day. I just uh, I feel that this area is not suitable for the building on. I mean, I think that's what the reports have said to date. And, uh, and I'm not sure why um, our staff are proceeding with uh, with that, you know, with that intention. And, and, I, and then with this report and this plan, I'm, I'm not understanding it either. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I just get a clarification, Mr. Earl, on this? Um, normally, like this land would be private purchased and someone has to do the geotechnical studies on this, obviously. And it seems like I, I know on the corner of even the time I've lived where I live right now, um, you know, different people have tried to do things on the corner of Wishart and Latoria and seemed to have failed every time they started the project, they failed <laughs> and, and nothing ever happened. So I, I guess I, I do understand your concern. So it, it, it's uh, like you said, uh, Councillor Day, you know, we get in the cart before the horse here, but before we start visioning, don't we have to, or is it their responsibility? Like whose responsibility is this right now? I guess that's where I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, uh, understand right now. It's like that, big building in Kelowna, right? Right beside the, the waterfront where it, it all sank on the garages. And, and there was a big fight in the court between, you know, the city was partly responsible for it in the end because they had a 1% responsibility. I forget exactly how it worked out, but so they did take on liability when it wasn't, I didn't think they'd have any liability. So I guess um, it, it's a good question that's being asked right now. And I don't know, you know, how, how that's handled. Like, do we, are, are we getting ahead of ourselves by visioning or do, do we sort of say, well, we vision this, but that's your technical problem. You pay for it. Is, is that how, the, what the steps is in the process? I, I don't understand. Thank you, Worship. I'm not sure I'm, I can directly answer your question, but okay. um, perhaps I'll provide some clarity. Um, as you're aware, we presented to council in the last year, uh, a geotechnical analysis of the roadway corridor uh, in this section, which provided the city uh, some comfort with respect to capacity uh, to construct uh, the necessary uh, uh, bike lane, sidewalk and laning infrastructure uh, that's envisioned uh, in the transportation master plan. Um, in doing so, uh, we discovered there are areas 
and not in significant areas where that will be more complex because of the nature of the peat uh, deposits in the area. Right. And we, uh, for the areas in our right of way, we have a, an understanding of that. Through that, uh, we determined that one of the uh, criteria of redevelopment of, of the road right of way and the adjacent properties is the protection of the creek. And that there's a second study that we presented um, indicated that there's a substantive opportunity to improve the habitat and quality of Latoria Creek through this stretch. To do that, uh, we need to ask from property owners as they move forward with development uh, for substantive uh, uh, gift of right of way so that we can create the room required uh, to create uh, the uh, a health improvement for the creek. And so the driver of this is the municipal desire to improve the quality of Latoria Creek as development occurs. The reason for the visioning is to do that, we need a substantively wider right of way to put that moved creek into, that improved creek into, moving the creek away from the roadway in the opinion of uh, the geotechnical, sorry, the environmental report would improve the quality of the creek. To ask for that, we need to have a plan, a land, a, a land use plan for the area. And so that's the reason that previous council supported visioning in this area. Visioning in this area was also uh, part of previous OCPs uh, in terms of an area redevelopment plan that never materialized. We also have um, a number of active applications, developers in this corridor who are seeking to move forward with projects on their property in an effort to have a foundation upon which we can stand and say, we are desirous to improve the quality of the creek. To do that, we need this pretty big ask in terms of right-of-way expansion. And if we have a complete plan for the area, we can show how that ask fits within a plan. So that's the reason that this ended up in our financial plan last year. It's the reason why it's here now. Development applications are already here. The city is desirous to improve the quality of Latoria Creek. We can't do those two things in isolation. They need to work together and uh, a visioning will help us think that through. Yeah, I sort of understand that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Ward. Mr. Earl, thank you for the explanation. I, I appreciate it. One quick question um, for anyone who can answer. Um, does this visioning uh, exercise inherently assume that Latoria will be widened according to the master transportation plan or can it be completed with the I guess the potential that the master transportation plan could see revision. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the visioning presumes the widening. Should the widening not be part of the plan for the area, a different vision uh, may unfold. Okay, thank you. Councilor Dave. Thank you. Um, I, I heard a couple of statements that concern me. Uh, one was as development occurs, which is making the assumption that all land is developable. Uh, some land should not be developed. Wetlands should not be developed. There are natural springs, water courses throughout the area. There are uh, known difficulties with developing in the area. The uh, most recent home that was built in the area parked a machine in the wetland areas in front of the home and it sunk overnight. So I'm not making it up and I don't want us to spend money on visioning the impossible. Uh, and I don't want us to fill in a wetland and uh, take away its functioning. It has great climate implications, wetland. And uh, 
I, I just cannot support continuing to expect development to make the impossible possible um, and, and bring pretty pictures to the table um, and then ask them to find a way to make it a reality uh, when our reality of more than 10 years of experience is that it can't be done. So uh, seeing no other comments or questions, could we just get a, a repeat of the motion on the table, please, Amanda? Okay, that's right. Um, that the, the motion is that the Latoria visioning item be removed from the 2023 budget. Okay. I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. So, Councillor Jordison and uh, Councillor Day. All those opposed? City was recently successful in a provincial grant application. As a result, we have a new special initiative, social planning poverty reduction grant related. As well, five-year review, the city's official community plan scheduled for this year. Pause, should there be any questions on either of these two initiatives? In the area of community planning, but specifically related to that of arts and culture, um, we have a couple of initiatives, uh, so starting with an arts and culture initiative in general, with previously approved in progress. Uh, we also have a previously approved and in progress heritage strategy and registry that are underway. Pause, should there be any questions on either of these two? Lastly, Indigenous protocol development. The city has a budget in place. This work is in progress and will continue through this year. Did want to highlight with respect to the heritage registry work that is in progress and underway. Previous financial plan had approved the introduction of a heritage grant program in 2023, $15,000 annually. Uh, staff are recommending that this introduction be deferred to 2024 and that we remove that $15,000 from this year, given that the work is in progress. Moving into the area of development services, three priorities are before you. There are no special initiatives proposed for this area. Did want to mention, we will be back before you on Monday evening Council to propose fee increases in this area for your consideration. We have reviewed those fee increases um, with the anticipated development activity. At this time, we're not proposing a change to the draft budget um, that's before you, uh, but we will have further conversation on those, those fee proposals on Monday. We'll pause if there's any questions or recommended changes in the area of development services, or we'll move along. Moving into the area of engineering, top three priorities are before you. And there are some special initiative works that are in progress and underway in this area, uh, both standards and specifications work. So the finalization of an update to our subdivision and servicing bylaw, transportation master plan update, comprehensive work that has been underway and continues in progress. Pause, should there be any questions on these areas? Sorry, Council Ward. Just for clarity, maybe Mr. Earl, when will we see the transportation master plan update come before Council? Maybe John, you idea on that. Thank you, Council Ward, through your worship. Uh, we're hoping the the actual completion of the plan will happen in Q3. Um, we're working on um, the model now, and part of that model is to determine the planning that we're going to see forward in the future to help uh, develop the, the model expectations with regards to future traffic planning. And part of that model development as you develop it, because there are a lot of, I guess we'll call them 
educational guesses is that once we put the model together based on um, planning um, of development and population growth, we then take the model, put it together, and then we go out and do traffic counts um, to see how those counts reflect today's traffic and how that model responds to that traffic and see if it represents today's traffic. So if we get the base of today's traffic correct, then we can layer on the future expectations to um, make it correct. We were able to use the CRD's uh, traffic counts that they did. They do traffic counts, I believe it's uh, every three years throughout the region. And the way we were able to save some money is to layer on their traffic counts, but we're not going to see their traffic counts probably till August or September. So it's going to take us a little longer to get to the transportation master plan piece. Along the way, we'll have several pieces of information that will come forward as part of that process. Like we're looking, we're currently looking in depth at the northern section of the Chosen Road uh, from Wishart to Souk. Um, so that'll come forward for council consideration, which, which will then we're anticipating probably further ask questions and perhaps maybe go further down the chosen and look at further areas within the chosen as well. We're also bringing back Souk uh, corridor that came to the transportation committee last June and staff uh, are looking at um, that cross section as well. They were asked to go away and come back with a, a variant on the cross section of <clears throat> cross sections that were proposed. So we're bringing those back as well as part of that. And then that'll help also flavor what we're going to do with regards to the cross sections that are coming forward as well. So the long answer was September. <laughs> you know, I appreciate that, John. Thank you. And, and just for clarity, because I think it's important, like on the the last vote we just held on the visioning, I, you know, I reluctantly supported going ahead with it. And my question around the the lane expansion of Latoria was was relevant in that I'm not necessarily convinced that the plan we have in place is the right one. I certainly wasn't elected on on running people three times the distance through you know three times the traffic lights and going against the, the flow. So I'm interested in the Machosen Road piece, but um, I think it, the reason I want to speak to this now was just that um, you know there's a lot of work going on and staff are working very hard on some of these initiatives. And you know if there's any kind of change in direction, there's cost ramifications and things that that come with that. And uh, you know, I'm one vote, but I certainly see the chosen road as the primary route. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to having an opportunity to discuss that before we, you know, get in so deep that we can't change anything. So just so you know where, where my perspective is, but I appreciate the, uh, the timeline and the insight. I can, I can just add to that. The, the model will allow us to actually layer on exactly what you just said. If we keep Latoria at two lanes, the way it's going and push everything on to Machosen, what would we have to do to get a level of service, say of D on Machosen? Would we have to go to four lanes? Would it work with two lanes? Can it work at all? I mean, that's what the model will allow us to do. We'll be able to put different scenarios to it, where a roundabout could or couldn't work, where uh, intersection or traffic lights will or won't work. We'll be able to do all of that. So it will give us a, a real chance. And I think back to Councillor's Day point the other day, we will be able to have like a workshop where we go through and go, okay, let's take a look at this section of it, come back, meet, go away, come back again. So there'll be some iterative processes there that we can actually uh, run through and see what does consequential. Moving forward in the financial plan, we have funding set aside for both the Roads DCC bylaw update, as well as the Stormwater Master Plan update. So Stormwater Master Plan last updated in 2018, uh, Roads DCC bylaw updated in 2021. We're doing some internal work this year uh, on, on that. Pause, should there be any questions? I, I do now. This is for, uh, to concert days, part um, in, in under community planning. I think this is where I think we have to insert um, some type of study here, you know, someone to go through some old geotechnical. So we, we understand what we're getting ourselves into this right now. Like I could see the vision, like I, I understand what was being done under community planning, hence I supported it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> this whole engineering question, the geotechnical stability, uh, but between um, Wishart and DMP, it just, it, there's something that's just bugging me. It just, 
that it hasn't, you know, every time they start these projects, I, I just keep on going to the Wishart Latoria corner there. And it's just like in the, in, in, the, in the years that I've lived there, I've seen two projects already start and stop and they failed because of things sinking into the ground. And it just didn't seem like anyone was, was moved. I don't know. I don't know the full story behind it, but there's something, there's something to be, to, uh, to be what's, uh, what's being said right now. There is something and, and I can't put my finger on it. So it's almost, it's not a planning function right now. To me, it's a, it's having that someone look at the history of this. Like, is it, is it, I, I can understand exactly what Councilor Day was, has been saying right now. It bothers me. Is the, is is it feasible to even build on that right now? And and the reason why <clears throat> I, I questioned this before when the plan was to do a four laner on Matoria Road, I was kind of looking at the, the land there, and it's kind of marshy in quite a few spots. And I was trying to wonder. I thought, well, this is going to be an engineering feat here. I mean, you can engineer everything, right? And and. That's why I kept on. I kept on asking the question: How much is this going to cost us? And, and no one had any ideas. And, and I guess I was the reason I was asking is because I was just looking at the soil there, and I was going, "Wow, uh, they're going to have you know you can you can engineer any solution. It just takes a lot of bucks." And I was always worried we never had we wouldn't collect enough DCC stuff, you know, because we didn't have a uh, you know a, 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 an engineering wild ass guess at that time what that was going to cost so it, it's a valid point that uh, Councillor Dave made I just felt I wanted to talk it under engineering like it you know whether we should have uh, some type of uh, project on this like I, I, I don't know it you know I, I'm willing to go ahead and with the visioning here but like do we really know what we're doing here I mean why has it failed so many times? And that's why I was just asking the question, is it our problem or not our problem? And, and I would tend to think it is part of our problem right now. If we're gonna, if we're gonna zone this to something here, I mean, you know, we're, we're gonna have a lot of people spending, I guess it's their dollars in, in a way, but I, I just think we have to understand what we're doing here. I, I, I don't know. I, if you tell me something different and give me guidance, um, this is all new stuff to me and, and I just, I just feel very uncomfortable by this right now. So I'm, I was waiting for this part to bring this, uh, bring this discussion up. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I can be very comfortable talking about work with on the road and in the public realm. Okay. And I'll provide a, perhaps a personal opinion on the private side of it and, and a direction that we could potentially look at. From a road perspective, uh, floating a road, and that's basically what you do in a peat area, is, is very doable. Um, it, it's not without cost. Um, the corridor, and I, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the entire corridor is not filled with peat. Um, there is a significant amount that is. Um, I've built roads, quite frankly, on worse than what I've seen there and what I've read in that report. The cost is the difference, right? So you'll pay a lot more to do it. So. I think back to Councilor Ward's point, council may choose to not even widen Latoria. And if that's the case, then we don't have to worry about the cost of that construction. But if we get into determining that we want to widen Latoria, then we're definitely gonna have to go back out there with the drill rig, do some more work, look at some bearing capacities, look at you know depths of structure and so on, and then determine a path forward with regards to a road. Now, putting a road down on Pete is significantly different than putting a building down on Pete. To simplify things, when I think about a road, think about you're, you're at the beach and you get on a raft, you can float on a raft. A guy as big as me can float on a raft because the raft has enough buoyancy to, to float that. So you basically float roads. When you get to buildings, it's like me standing on a raft. It's really hard to stand on that raft. So it would be the expectation that if somebody were gonna to try to build something on private property, it would be their work and their effort to determine whether they could structurally do that or not and what that would take. You can drive a pile 200 feet down until you get bearing capacity to rock and then have a bunch of stilts that then you build on. That's possible, but is that feasible from a development point of view? So my suggestion would be that we can come back from an engineering and the third report, it does talk about further investigations and what those lands are. And it talks a little bit about the history of those lands. So I would suggest that what we could do, at least for an initial thought, is 
will engage server, ask them about that area and what it would take to get an initial analysis of that area and what they see, and then whether they could determine anything without going on to private property and drilling on that private property based on previous records and other things that they saw and kind of doing a historical research on the property. We could get a price on that, bring that back to council and see if that's something we want to do and, and, and a direction we want to take. And then at least try to fit one more piece into the puzzle. I, I would feel better about it, to tell you the truth. Um, Councillor Day, do you have a comment on that? Please. My only comment is that the geotechnical work that's been done so far only goes down 65 feet. And there's a lot more than a road to worry about. There is a sewer line under that road. There's a water line under that road. And everything that I've read on the geotech report so far only goes down 65 feet and then stops. So the, the, the depth, um, and yes, I, I know it's an irregular peat bog, but also uh, wetlands are very important for carbon sequestration, for proper ecosystem functioning. And I recognize that there's been a real desire uh, to create uh, ecological benefits anywhere that we've disturbed the land adjacent to the road. Um, but uh, our investigations have been very minimal, not ecosystem wide. So we need to start looking bigger. Uh, if I lived in Langford, I wouldn't have supported the development of Hull's Field either. And there were significant problems with those buildings afterwards. I take my responsibility as a member of council seriously. My job is to protect the future homeowners. So I sure hope we're not approving developments where they're not safe. Okay. That concludes the review of engineering special initiatives. So if there are no recommended changes to this area, we'll move on to public works. So as you'll recall, this is the one area where council directed a decreased level of service specifically with respect to the Colwood cleanup event. This event has been terminated. Uh, the financial implications associated with that termination have been reflected in the operating budget that's before you. Top three priorities are before you and within the document, and there are no related special initiatives. I'll pause should you have any questions or recommended changes in this area. Otherwise, we'll move along to the next. Area of roads, top three priorities are before you. There are no special initiatives um, related to any of the public works areas. And I will pause should council have any recommended changes or questions with respect to this area. Parks, trails and recreation, top priorities are before you. With respect to the special initiatives, as you know, we have the individual parks management plans in progress. Uh, the city has completed both approved and draft plans on, I believe, five parks, and we're continuing that work into 2023. Uh, you'll recall we've recently entered into an agreement with Parks Canada. Um, as a result, we've got funding both to support that initiative, but also uh, for a parks planner position that is supporting that initiative. Uh, federal grant monies are funding those. Pause should you have any questions in this area. You've heard conversation and reference uh, to the fact that the city doesn't currently collect a Parks DCC. That is a pri top priority for us this year to introduce a Parks DCC bylaw. Um, as well, we have an urban forest management plan previously approved. That work is in progress. Waterfront planning and parks lease. Uh, this is a new proposed budget for next year. I'll pause should there be any questions in this area. Moving into the area of boulevards, no related initiatives. The top three priorities are before you. 
Paul, should you have any questions or recommended changes to this area? Storm sewers, we have the top three priorities before you. Operating and budgeting clothes to support the maintenance of this service area. And there are no, um, no additional special initiative budgets. Uh, so lastly, the area of the sewer utility will be maintaining this service. Uh, the top three priorities are before you. And we have no related special initiative budgets in this area. Uh, we did have a fair bit of conversation during service review with respect to the continued phase in um, of the CRD related sewage treatment costs. Um, so we are expecting an increase in our sewer user fee rates. Uh, we have not yet completed calculations. My expectation is if uh, the consumption remains consistent with previous year, it will likely be close to an approximate 20% increase. Um, so we, we do benefit somewhat um, from the fact that every year we're generating between you know, $40,000, $50,000 in additional revenue because of new um, sewer connections, primarily associated with the city's new development, uh, but we will be proposing an increase in, in rates, uh, both to support that continued phase in um, of the CRDs related costs, um, but also you heard reference earlier this week about the introduction of the um, pump station replacement program, and we want to ensure that the utility is, is setting aside funds for that. Pause, should there be any questions? Councillor Day. Thank you. So it remains a big concern of mine, uh, the capacity of the sewage treatment plant at the CRD. Um, so I know that's probably um, a lot of the questions will need to be answered at, at the CRD level for um, some of that. But because I was involved with its creation, I know that there, there's no magic bullet uh, in terms of sewer capacity. Uh, the next sewage treatment plant will need to have a new outfall. It will be whoever needs the capacity who will be forced to pay for creating that plant. Um, are we collecting money uh, of any kind and keeping it in a reserve for that eventuality? Sorry, I won't answer that question, but I'll, I'll just provide uh, some lead up information to, for Jen to ans answer your question. Uh, we have completed our sewer master plan updates. There's not a budget here for it, but we have not yet presented that to council. We are aware of council's acute desire to understand within that document uh, how our capacity at the CRD affects our ability to actualize that plan. So we are adding an addendum to that plan uh, seeking advice from uh, the original author as to creating greater granularity around uh, how many units of capacity or years of capacity we have left. Uh, we have also either just reached out or about to reach out to the CRD to get their comment on the same question. And so when we do bring our sewer master plan into chambers, we'll uh, bring with it uh, a refined estimation of how many years or units of capacity we have remaining together with uh, uh, some recent conversation from the CRD on um, should we reach the ceiling that Colwood has prepaid for, what's the next step or how would that be um, approached? And I'll have Jen answer your actual question. Through your worship, direct answer is no. Uh, so right now we are, the sewer utility sets aside funding both for the sewer fleet and equipment replacement. Uh, we've introduced additional funding to support the sewer pump program. We collect an enhancement fee that is set aside for specific purposes, but that ultimately is that of enhancing the existing system. Um, and so should we want to be setting aside additional funding right now, we would need to propose an additional increase to our sewer user fee. Yeah. 
So I'll, I'll just say that uh, because I was very actively involved in, in, in the creation of um, our uh, current sewage treatment plant at the CRD and in Colwood with proposed alternatives, that uh, I believe that this is a serious concern for the city. And it's the reason why I could not support uh, a development proposal that was recently before council is because I feel that that is such uh, an insecure future for Colwood of unknown costs, uh, because it will be a willing seller, willing buyer arrangement to achieve any additional capacity in the sewage treatment plant. Um, that that is a, a major concern. And when residents ask me if they should repair their septic system or join the sewer program, my answer to them is that the costs are so unknown at this point in time that uh, any cost to uh, improve their septic system uh, is worth the investment. And sorry to your worship, if I may quickly correct myself, we have a couple of options so we can look at increasing sewer user fees. We also still maintain a local area service for the main area um, and under the existing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, parcel tax collection bylaws, we would have the ability to levy a tax, levy a parcel tax. So we introduce a parcel tax to set aside funding for such a purpose. Thank you. Okay. Could we, could you come back with some options for us then, Jen? Certainly. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, it, it, could you confirm something for me, Mr. Oldenoff? I understand it's not only, not just an outflow issue, it's also a size of pipe issue that we, we may have going, going into the future here. So can you just confirm that for me? The, the sewer master plan uh, presumes uh, additional development will occur in Colwood. Mm -hmm. In certain areas, and as a result of that, uh, certain lift stations or certain sections of pipe uh, may need to be uh, upsized uh, to accommodate that capacity. Those, uh, from my perspective, are not substantive compared to the cost of sewering uh, the parts of Colwood uh, that aren't yet sewered. The, the, to, to sewer the remaining parts of Colwood that aren't yet sewered is in the magnitude of $100 million. The, so there are some system upgrades that will need to occur within our internal collection system. And depending on when we hit our ceiling, then there'll be a negotiation with other CRD users as Councillor Day has uh, forecasted. Thank you very much. Please. And so with that, we have, we have reviewed the entirety of this draft financial plan document. Uh, we have received some recommended changes. Um, so currently we're sitting at 3.62% uh, increase to support existing operations. Uh, we have an additional 1.1% to support the increased RCMP officer. And then we've got 1.71% to support increased transfers to reserves. So specifically the 0.71 uh, that council resolved tonight with respect to the RCMP facility. And then of course the 1% uh, for the sustainable infrastructure. We have time set aside tomorrow evening if council so wishes. Um, at this point, <clears throat> unless council has any further recommended changes, our next step is to return with this document updated and a draft financial plan uh, that will speak to that tax increase that I just mentioned. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was ahead, not sorry. writing down the numbers and I got off track. Can you just give me the total? Certainly. So at the onset of this evening, the total tax increase was 6.58% plus the one, 7.58. We've reduced that by 1.15%. So we're now sitting at an overall increase of 6.43% for Great. 2023. Thanks, so I don't hear comment on any further recommended changes. My recommendation is we don't meet tomorrow evening. We're scheduled. I will return with the draft bylaw for first three readings on March 13th. Great, thank you very much. I think everyone here wants to come back tomorrow.
right? <laughs> Thank you very much. May I get a motion to adjourn, please? <laughs> Councillor Olson, seconder, Councillor Grove, all in favor? Unanimous. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Jordison, for joining us tonight. I hope you get better. <laughs>